Hello and welcome to This Is Us. I'm Becca King-Reed. This week we're in the studio of Tony Graziano who makes beautiful ukuleles and today he's going to show us how it's done. You know, ukuleles originally came from Portugal. Portuguese immigrants brought them to Hawaii and in 1915 the Hawaiians brought them to the World's Fair where they caused a sensation. They were very, very popular during the Jazz Age and they're enjoying a renaissance now. Today we're going to take you through the making of the world's most happy instrument. A little later in the show, we're going to profile this country's most successful sailor, John Kostecki. John is an Olympic medal winner and two-time Yachtsman of the Year. Kostecki is currently the tactician sailing aboard Team USA's America's Cup Defending Championship boat. Then dust off your dancing shoes and take a lesson from the U.S. Champion Swing Dance Team of Kurt Sensor and Heather Powers. We've got a lot of great stories to share, and it all starts now. This is us. Welcome back. From Arthur Godfrey to Tiny Tim, many musicians have just been captivated by the little four-string instrument known as the ukulele. And today we're going to find out how those are made. We're in the workshop of Tony Graziano. And Tony, thanks for inviting us in. Well, thank you for coming. It's nice to have you here. It's great to be here. It's just so fun with all the parts and all the, all the wood and all the beautiful instruments. Tell us how, take us from the beginning of a, with a chunk of wood to when you have the body of, of a ukulele built. Okay, um, in this instance, we have here is a big piece of mahogany. Um, this is Central American woods, used a lot for ukuleles. Um, so we start out with something like this. Really thick. Yeah, well, they're, they're very large trees, you know, and then you cut whatever size piece of wood out. For ukuleles, you don't need very much wood, obviously, because they're small. So we start with a piece of wood, say like this. And then using a bandsaw, we'll cut thin slices out, and you'll get these pieces ah. like this. And uh, what we'll do is we'll cut two two pieces and then book match them, as it's called. You so you get a symmetrical up. grain pattern. Yeah, it's like it's like a book. It's opened up. Ah, so you get the both sides look the same. Both sides look the same, and we do the same thing with the sides. Uh-huh. So both um, sides will be the same? Yeah, the grain's pretty subtle here, but you can still see it. So, after this is glued together, um, it's then run through a, um, a wide belt sander, a sanding machine, which thicknesses it down to the proper thickness you want for a finish. Uh, and you want things to be very thin for a uke because you want it lightweight. Okay? And why, is, why light is important? Uh, there's not much tension from the strings, little nylon strings. Um, and to get optimal sound out of it, you don't want to overbuild it. If you do that, it's strong, it'll last forever, but it won't sound very good. <laughs> <laughs> and if it doesn't sound very good, you don't, you know, it's like you don't have a great uke. Well, not really, yes, yes, you missed the point. <laughs> yeah. So next we have, here's a back. This happens to be made out of walnut, but it's been joined together and run through the thickness sander. It's down to about two millimeters, around 80 thousandths of an inch. That's beautiful. And uh, so this is ready to be. So now, how would you cut, cut this shape? out? Another. I saw? cut it out like on another bandsaw. You just sort of follow the thing, and you leave it a little bit big so that you can trim it down later. Um, here's a top made out of spruce, which is very lively sound wood. Uh, so you, now we see the hole. And you can see where the sound hole is going to be, where the bridge is going to be, just to lay that out. And when you have this laid out, the next thing to do would be to put your sound hole rosette pattern in, which is a decorative strip ah. that goes around the sound hole. It's decoration mostly. Does it also add stability or, or protection? It'll stop any kind of uh, lengthwise cracking that might happen from damage or whatever, but mostly it's for decoration. And um, here I'll show you a top that has a um, this is a soprano, which is the smallest. It's a little tiny compared yeah, to the other. Yeah, to the baritone, yeah. which is the biggest. You can see yeah. the difference in size. Oh, it's like baby bear and grandpa, <laughs> grand, grandpa bear. <laughs> and this has a rosette pattern done in uh, double strips of abalone. It's beautiful. So yeah, it's very flashy. Oh. It's kind of nice. Okay. And on the back, you can see the br the bracing pattern has been laid out on this. You got okay. two and is that what we have here? So how, yeah, how this has two cross braces and a little bridge patch. This is a different style, so it has a different bracing pattern. We basically use these sticks of spruce that have been cut to a certain size and glue them on. 
and then shave them down with um, a little plane and, and chisels. Well, we'll be back with more of how to build ukuleles in just a second, but first, John Gregg profiles John Kostecki, America's best sailor. Sleek, swift, and silhouetted against the backdrop of the Golden Gate, she's the most sensuous image imaginable on San Francisco Bay. Slicing through the water, she'll take your breath away, while mere mortal men scramble to harness her power and gain what every sailor craves, what every sailor covets, speed. Speed that rockets through your bones and fills your lungs with life. She's also home to this country's very best sailor, America's Cup Oracle Team USA tactician, and the pride of San Rafael, John Kostecki. The AC-72 is um, incredibly fast, um, incredibly physical, and you know challenging to sail, and uh, especially here on San Francisco Bay with the winds that we have. America's Cup racing is remarkably fast and can be frighteningly dangerous. Laughing through the water doing 40 knots on a 72-foot catamaran can be treacherous. Kostecki is a former Olympian, a winner of the Volvo Around the World race, a two-time Rolex Yachtsman of the Year award winner, and now a six-time America's Cup sailor. But he first got his start on the water at the Richmond Yacht Club when he was still a toddler. Well, I was two and a half when my parents first took me along on, on, on the boat, and um, I really enjoyed it. My uh, parents actually named the Lido 14 kind of after what I would say, which was more and more. John's passion for sailing has never wavered. And when he was a kid, sailing and racing was the sport that consumed him. My parents got me involved in uh, Richmond Yacht Club Junior Program, and uh, that was on the weekends. And when uh, in the summertime when that wasn't happening, um, I would go out and race with my dad on, on larger boats with his friends and whatnot. And I, I just really, really enjoyed it, and it was just, during the week, what I looked forward to was sailing on the weekends with my father. Kostecki's career took a significant jump when he won the silver medal at the 1988 Summer Olympics in South Korea. I would say stepping stone in my career. Very intense um, training um, and focus on winning an Olympic medal. And it started about five years out, um, so in 83. I started in Olympic sailing and um, ended up competing in the 84 Olympic trials and with the full intent of, you know, doing an Olympic campaign for 1988. 1988 proved to be a hallmark year for Kostecki. After the Olympics and winning several world titles, he was honored as the Rolex Yachtsman of the Year. I was fortunate to, you know, win that honor in uh, 1988 after winning uh, two world championships and one design classes and then uh, also uh, winning the uh, silver medal in the Olympics. And so, you know, it, it was a great honor and, you know, a great award to receive. Kostecki continued to add to his reputation as one of the world's elite sailors when he captured the 2001-2002 Volvo Around the World race. Skippering the German backcountry Ilbruck Challenge, Kostecki led the team to an overwhelming victory in what is considered to be the world's most difficult and toughest endurance sailing race. The event took nine months, and after the win, John was honored for the second time as the Yachtsman of the Year. Emotionally, I have never been in a sailboat race or been in any other life situations with incredible highs and incredible lows. And so I would say that's probably the, the takeaway from, from that race that I'll never forget. Kostecki's role on the AC-72 is a tactician working alongside Australian helmsman Jimmy Spithill. It's sort of like a pitcher and catcher in baseball as they try to find the quickest way around the course. Jimmy's a, a great sailor. Obviously, I have a lot of respect for his abilities as a helmsman, but also he's a, he's a great tactician on his own. So um, at times, you know, if I'm a little bit off, sometimes he can pick up the slack. And uh, times if he's a little off, I can pick up the slack. So we have a great relationship. 
Kostecki helped to win back the America's Cup in 2010. This time around, he finds himself in the role as the defender. And if there's an advantage for the American boat, it comes from the experience of a guy that grew up selling the tricky currents and winds of San Francisco Bay. It's a dream come true, really, for me to have the America's Cup on San Francisco Bay where I, you know, grew up and learned how to sail. For over 150 years, sailors have been battling it out to capture a silver chalice known as the America's Cup. This time around, men from Lisbon to London and from Paris to Perth are set to square off on San Francisco Bay. And the pride of San Rafael, fueled by an inner fire, will do his best to hang on to sailing's greatest prize. We're back in the studio with Tony Graziano, and he's going to continue to show us the assembly of a beautiful ukulele. And right now we're going to talk about how he gets that fabulous curvy shape out of a hard block of wood. How do you make the sides? Well, as you remember, we had these pieces of wood that were cut out of our first board. Um, then we sand them to a proper thickness and cut them with a taper at the neck end, so it's a little bit shallower than at the bottom end. That uh, gives you that nice, nice shape. Um, you take this piece of wood, put it in a trough of water, boil it for a while, kind of like pasta, pasta. you know, just <laughs> al, al dente, just right, uh, until it gets nice and noodly. And then we can either bend it in one of these forms with a bending machine or over a hot pipe by hand, which is the old school way, going back to the Spanish. Is it hard to get two the same that way? With practice, it's surprisingly easy, but uh, yeah, it can be, which is why these are more in favor now because it's just, it's easier, it's more accurate. So you take this noodly piece of wood, put it in here, underneath all this, between these metal plates with this hot blanket in here, and crank everything down and let it cook for about a half hour. And then the machine shuts off and it cools down. And when it's back down to room temperature, you open everything up and you pop out a bent side. Wow, How that's about amazing. That? And yeah. it stays like that. It doesn't it stays spring like back. That. Yeah, no, it's a little spring back, but you know, it's, it's pretty much the shape you want it to be. Okay. Then you take these, your sides, and you put them into a form. Uh, it's called a building form. And as you can see, we have two sides in here. This one happens to have a cutaway because of it's a fancier shaped ukulele. Then we add a neck block, a tail block, and these linings. Now the linings hold the top and the back onto the sides. So you have some structure to stick the side, right. the top to. And then the neck is attached to the neck block in the body. Well, let's see how you make a neck. Okay. What I'm going to do is move this stuff slightly yeah, out of the way. You. All right. And once again, we have several chunks of wood. Ah, again, with the yeah. chunks of wood. The chunks of wood. And we're <laughs> going to show you some fingerboards while we're doing this, okay? Okay. All right. So, once again, a large chunk of mahogany. Yeah. In this case. Pretty good size. Yeah. And then we lay out a pattern on it and cut it out on a bandsaw. So it's all one piece. It's all one piece. This is about 15, 13 to 15 degree angle. And will that be where the strings are tightened? This is where the tuning machines will go, yeah. Okay, so you take this and um, we'll put a veneer on, a fancy veneer on for the headstock. Uh -huh. So you can have um, something on there if you want to. You have yeah. your name, but you, you can have Or you can have, have custom inlay work or you can have nothing on there. And I usually use these, um, use the wood on these to match whatever wood our fingerboard's going to be. And in this case, it's ebony. Uh -huh. uh, we start with a flat piece of wood. Put a piece of tape on the back and do wow. our fret pattern uh, where our slots are going to be. And then we cut these on a table saw with a oh. fret slotting blade. It's a very thin blade. Yeah. And it cuts a slot the proper thickness for the fret wire. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So this is not, it's not a, it's not a lot of little pieces stuck together. It's one no, it's big one piece, piece carefully wood. sliced. Yeah, with the slots cut, um, you know, partially through. So you have this, then you put some inlays in it where you want your positions to be so you know where you are in your fingerboard. Once again, this is a lot of this is decoration. It is beautiful. Then it's cut to a taper. So as you can see, it's narrower at the at the top end than it is down at the bottom end. All right. So when we come back, can you show us a finished product? I certainly can. Okay. Well, we'll be back in a minute with the finished product. But first, we're going to send you to a different kind of studio. We're going to meet a couple of local dancers who are the U.S. champions of swing. 
It's not easy to find someone who is as dedicated as you are. Having the right partner is everything. It's not just work, it's fun. Damn! <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Kurt Sensor and Heather Powers move together like a newer, cooler Fred and Ginger. It's dancing the way it should be, effortless. Not bad for a couple who have been swing dancing with one another for just over a year. During that short time, they've received top honors. I'm still learning to dance. It's so different than ballet. Heather may be new to swing dancing, but not performing. She stepped into her first pair of ballet shoes at age three. By 14, she had signed with a company to dance professionally. From Joffrey to the Toledo Ballet, it was a whirlwind time for Heather. But eventually, the dance took its toll. You know, it, it's, it's hard on your body, very hard on your body. I was so injured that there comes a point when you really need to stop and uh, let your body rest. Kurt's path to the dance world was not so clear cut. After all, guys don't earn bragging rights for learning the foxtrot. I knew I enjoyed it, it just wasn't, you know, cool, you know, so when I did start learning how to dance, I didn't tell my friends. <laughs> they always wonder, where are you going? Before long, Kurt got good, really good. Soon he was competing in both ballroom and country dance contests. In 1997, Kurt and his partner won the Country Western World Champion title. Despite his success, he never felt comfortable on center stage and decided to retire from competition. Because I'm kind of uh, a shy kind of person, if I'm on the social floor, yeah, I'm already last because I'm not being judged. So it was just, you know, I was like, okay, I've done, I've been there, done that. Kurt decided to change his focus. He began to teach and master the West Coast swing. It was the one dance he had yet to nail. The West Coast is a little more challenging because there's more to the basics and getting it down. The West Coast swing is sort of the most current of the swing dances in that we dance to popular music that's played now. One turn, two, and... Heather first encountered the West Coast swing at a gymnastics studio. I was teaching um, ballet to competitive gymnasts um, in Vallejo, and the woman who's the head coach there, her son is a West Coast swing dancer. He was starting to teach West Coast Swing, and she required me, actually, to take his class. <laughs> but then I got sort of a taste for what West Coast Swing was all about. Heather was hooked. Determined to improve, she took lessons at her nearby dance studio, and that's where she met Kurt, who by then had perfected his swing. Back when I was really beginner, I think he thought I was kind of a little wild on the dance floors, but um, eventually I got a lot better. Everything Kurt had been looking for in a partner, he found in Heather. Suddenly, the West Coast swing didn't seem so difficult after all. We would go out there and do a pro-am, and we ended up winning. You know, I think she learned the dance you know, a couple months before. So she's beaten these ladies that have been doing it for years. So that made me start thinking. Setsu and Heather Powers, first out tonight. After 15 years away, Kurt decided he was ready to compete again. The plan was to start slowly at the smaller pro events. He wasn't sure what to expect. When I got out there, I, was, I felt comfortable. I think because Heather made me feel comfortable because she was like, you know, no, let's have fun. It's the dance chemistry is what it is. After only eight months together, Kurt and Heather won three competitions. That's when talk began about entering the U.S. Open Swing Dance Championship. It's the granddaddy of all swing contests. Dancers from all over the world come to compete. Yeah, if you would have asked me uh, a few years back about doing the US Open, I was like, no, out of question, no way. Went through here, kind of that, going around. But this time was different. The pair dedicated themselves to perfecting the choreography, music, and costumes for the routine. That night came, we uh, competed, we did really well. I think it's been so long since Kurt's actually been on the competitive circuit that everyone was really excited to see him. We knew that we had a chance of placing, but we didn't think we had a chance of winning. We knew that we did the best that we could, but we didn't know if that was going to be good enough. <laughs> winning was very unexpected and super exciting. 
there's no stopping Heather and Kurt now. This past year, they've won every competition they've entered with their near flawless routine. Soon their sights will be set on the U.S. Open again. One, two, winding up. In the meantime, they're teaching others how to swing dance, including Heather's own son and daughter. The duo are competing against adults with winning results. Yeah, Caroline! It's a rush to, you know, see your students do well. It's kind of like the perfect moment, dare I say. Yeah, the perfect moment. Welcome back. As you can see, this is the big reveal. Here are the beautiful instruments, all finished, um, made in Tony's studio. These are really lovely. Tell me a little bit about um, the size. Why different sizes? Well, uh, different sizes, different pitches. Uh, the original ukulele was a very small instrument. So we have the soprano. And uh, then you have a concert, which is like a supercharged soprano. And then you get up to a tenor, <laughs> has heavier strings. Uh, longer scale, more fingerboard access. A lot of professionals like these just because they're easier to maneuver. Yeah. And then a baritone is actually tuned like a guitar without those two pesky bass strings. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now these ha are all beautiful woods. And um, tell me, uh, is there a reason for choosing one over another? Well, uh, part of it is tone and part of it is just, you know, looks what you like. Uh, the original Hawaiian ukes were all basically made out of koa because it was a local hardwood and it's very pretty. Mainland ukes tended to be made out of mahogany because they had a lot of it from the guitar industry and stuff like that. It was, it was more easily available. And um, now we use all kinds of combinations of things. Like this tenor is made out of uh, California walnut. Oh, it's beautiful. As you can see, back. yeah, it's yeah. real pretty, the back and sides. And it has a redwood top. This is Sinker Redwood from the Mendocino River Estuary. And it has all these wonderful colors from being sunken being in submerged. the river for a hundred years. Yeah. Now this one's a really unusual ukulele made of bamboo. Tell me about that. Well, bamboo is, it's a grass. So um, there's plenty of it that just keeps growing and growing. Uh, I got interested in it when I first saw a, uh, a guitar at a guitar show that was made by the Yamaha company back when we were looking for alternative woods and they thought well try this try and so um, I got intrigued by it some friends were putting in a bamboo floor <laughs> so I said hey I can do that so I grabbed some flooring <laughs> uh, made a uke out of it now you can buy the stuff in sheet stock so you don't have to cut up flooring and glue it all together and do that kind of thing um, it's nice it has a very nice bright sound um, and it's green it's green I like it this happens to have a palm wood fretboard and bridge oh. which is also you know there's a lot of palm trees out there and um, so it's, it's a become sustainable, quite a, yeah, a it's sustainable a, yeah it's kind of the green uke and these are done fairly plainly without the rosette pattern to the edge binding can you play it for us oh. let's play us out well, it's time for us to say goodbye. On that note, we must leave you. So for all of us at This Is Us, aloha from SoCal.